That'll take care of the noise or not. Good morning. I like you better without that. You'd grow a nice one, but I like you better without it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for being able to come here and freely worship you. I thank you for this family and friends that you have given each one of us, Lord, that you want us to be in a relationship with you and a relationship with each other. I thank you for the spirit that you give each one of us where we can come together. And even though we have differences and different likes and things, Father, that we can come together and worship you together to know that you are the creator of all things, to know that you love us enough that you would send Jesus Christ to die for our sins. We just thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain that you've given us. We thank you for the freedom that we have in this country and all the wonderful things that you've blessed us with. Have your spirit come upon us today and teach us your word and help us apply it to our hearts. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So this week, I killed an elk. Yay! Everybody excited? I'm excited. Okay? I'm excited so I want to tell everyone. Huh? I don't know if it's a little calf, but anyway... And, and my wife has cooked me two meals off of it, even though she didn't feel good. It's so good. We're celebrating because this is my first elk that I've killed out here. Because I thought that I would come out to Idaho and hunt and fish all the time and kill and catch all these things. But sometimes things aren't exactly as what we think they're going to be. But I'm excited about it. Yay! So shouldn't... So shouldn't we be just as excited? No, we should be so more excited about telling people of Jesus Christ. What we have. That elk is no comparison whatsoever to what God has given me through Jesus Christ. He has given me eternal life, sonship. I am an, a child of the King, of God Almighty who breathed and created billions and billions of stars. The, the more we look, the more we see the greatness and the beauty that God has created for us. That's how much He loves us. That's how much He longs for us to tell others of the joy that we have in our hearts. So this message is entitled, Servants of Christ. What does that mean to you? We're reading Romans, and I just keep reading Romans 1 over and over again and see the desire and the passion that Paul has to tell others of Jesus Christ. Even though he's in chains, even though things don't go the way he wants them to go, even though he's persecuted and in prison, he still wants to tell others about Christ. He is the chief of sinners, the one who went out and persecuted God's beloved children, his family. And yet God still says, I want you to be a part of my family, and I want to use you to spread the gospel message. 
few weeks ago we asked a question, or the sermon was entitled, Who do you say that I am? And I hope you've been pondering that. That's a question that Jesus asked. Because it makes all the difference in the world. Is Jesus anything to you? Is He everything to you? What, he, what is He to you? So many Christians do accept Jesus as their Savior because they want what Jesus has to offer. And Jesus is clear in the Scriptures of those that just want, want what He has to offer. We're saved. Yes, we're saved if we accept Jesus Christ, if we believe that He is God's only Son and that He came and died for our sins. But there's so much more. Is He Lord of your life? Paul asked the question, Lord, what will you have me do? He asked that on the road to Damascus because he realized who Jesus Christ was. That Jesus wasn't just saving him so that he could be redeemed and a, a child of the true God. He saved him so that he could be his hands and feet. Because Jesus was going to leave this earth. And he was going to leave Christians with the obligation, the duty, the privilege to tell others of Jesus Christ. So if I can put on Facebook that I killed an elk, how much more do I want to tell others that God saved me through the blood of His only Son, Jesus Christ. It's what we're here for. It's our job. It's our purpose as Christians. When I was a young boy, I got saved. I can't even tell you the exact time that I got saved because I was blessed to grow up in a Christian household. My mother worked so that I could go to Christian school. We went to church frequently. Well, I did Awanas. That's why I'm so passionate about Awanas and such. But I think back about those things and I say, why? Why when there's so much suffering and pain in this world did God bless me so much? And I don't have an answer for you that will knock you off your feet or anything else. I don't know except God is in control. He knows every hair on my head. He knows everything that's going on. He's even in control of this election. Don't forget that. He knows everything. And He placed me in this time with the parents that I had, with the access that I had to technology, to everything else, and He saved me from the wrath that is so justly due for me. Because the wages of my sin is death, eternal separation from God. But He saved me. So I don't know why I was blessed so much, but I know that with those blessings, like our Scripture says this morning, that much is required. And I am so thankful... And I realized that I don't know why God did those things. I don't know why I'm blessed so much. But since I am, I have an obligation and a duty and a responsibility and a privilege to tell others of Jesus Christ. I am so thankful for that. And He's entrusted me with so much. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that he longs to tell others about Jesus Christ. Even when he's in chains, even when he fears for his life, he longs to tell others about Jesus Christ so that they can get this disease that we have. That they can be a Jesus freak, whatever you want to call it. That they will be sold out for the gospel message. So you have to answer those questions. Who do you say that I am? That's what Jesus asked. All of us are blessed beyond our wildest imaginations. This is a terrible world we live in, but it's a beautiful world we live in. And the difference that makes all the difference in the world is whether people know Jesus Christ as their Savior or not. And we need to live a life that shows that, but we need to tell others also. And then you need to ask, Lord, what will you have me to do? So that you can answer those questions. That you can find out what God's will is. And He knows exactly where you're at in this place. He knew that you were going to be born in the United States. He knew what parents you were going to be born to. He knew what job you would be working. So I have the privilege to be up here and be able to talk to all of you as an audience. But you have a privilege to do something that I don't have. To talk about Jesus at the meal. Or to talk about Jesus in your classroom. Hey, it might get you fired even. But what do you want to do? Do you want to tell others about Jesus Christ? Or do you fear the things of this world? You are all uniquely placed in a ministry. And you need to tell others about Jesus Christ. And you need to live a life that glorifies Him. <clears throat> to be like Christ, that's what a Christian means, or little Christ. But when we see so many people in this world today that say they're a Christian, I don't see that it's like Christ. I don't see a little Christ. I see someone that proclaims one thing with their mouth, 
but their hearts are far from Him. And we need to realize that and we need to stand even more boldly in this day and age. Because if the world thinks that's what Christians are, then why would they want to have any part of them? And how will that ever lead anyone to salvation? And we are working not to go hunting to kill an elk, but for the salvation of our souls, the salvation of other people's souls. It is a matter of eternal life and death. Jesus was a humble servant of all. He gave up heaven and came and set us as an example. And He taught us the things to say and do. When He left, He empowered us with His Spirit so that we would have everything that we need. We went over Mark 1 through 17, or 1 17 before. It says, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. The King James Version says, Come you after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. We concentrated on that part that Jesus is saying, Come and follow after me. Dute apiso mu are the Greek words where you have to come to Him, which means you leave behind the things that have a hold on you now. This world, the cares of this world. You have to leave that behind, and you have to come after Jesus and follow in His footsteps, which the disciples did immediately. They left their nets. They left their father's business, and they followed after Jesus. But the rest of that verse says, And I will send you out to fish for people. Or in the King James, I will make you to become fishers of men. We're going to focus on that a little bit more. Mark 1.7 records a piece of moo also. It says, And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I am, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and tie and untie. John the Baptist knew exactly what his job was, what he was called to do. He left this world behind and went out into the wilderness and proclaimed that the Messiah was coming, Jesus Christ. That was His job. That was what God called Him to do. He was born in exactly that place and time to exactly the parents He was supposed to be born to with exactly the calling that God set Him apart to be. And you and I are no different. We might preach to thousands. We might preach to the ones just in our workplace and our home. But we are called to preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ if we have accepted Him as our Savior and Lord. John the Baptist knew what his calling was. He knew that he was unworthy, not qualified, but yet he was still obedient. And Jesus says to everyone, Come and follow after me. What I teach you to do, what I have called you to do, you have to decide if you're going to truly follow after Jesus. And he's clear in all of his teachings. And we could spend all day today talking about those teachings. But that's what it means to be a Christian, to be like Christ. That's the reason you come after Him and you leave the world behind. So that you can follow Him, that you can be like Him in actions and in words. So that you don't live a contrary life to what Jesus lived. So that you do preach the message with boldness. Matthew records the event also in Matthew 3, 1 through 3. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching. That means proclaiming as a herald, a messenger, has an obligation to proclaim this. What is he proclaiming? The gospel message, that Jesus Christ is coming. He did this in the wilderness saying, Repent or change your mind, change your way of thinking. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, A voice, is, a voice of one calling in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord, making paths straight for Him. So not only was John the Baptist obedient and knew his calling, but Isaiah talked about it hundreds of years before that this would happen. Wow, to see the fulfillment of, of prophecy in Scriptures, to see the purposes that God has for His people, and every one of us is a part of that. Repent was His message. To change your mind and way of thinking. I don't know what your way of thinking and your mind is. You do. I don't. I know the things that I have to think. When, when God called me to come pastor the church, I had to th- not think anymore. I had to change my way of thinking that I'm not qualified. That nobody wants me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll eat some worms. You ever heard that? 
My dad used to do, sing that all the time. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Think I'll eat some worms. Nathan's looking at me like I'm an idiot. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I don't sing that song. I had to say, other people are trained. They are more qualified than I am. Surely the free Methodist will bring someone in. I had to take all these things and change my way of thinking and say, whatever thy will is, Father, I will do. I will come after you no matter what it takes and follow you. And that's what Jesus is calling all of us to do. Not just me, every single one of us to repent, to change our ways, because the kingdom of God is here. Jesus Christ has come. He has died for our sins, and we have a message to preach. Because one day it's going to be too late. One day He's going to come again, and there'll be no chance for us to preach the gospel message again. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but we come to church and we sing songs of praise. We fellowship with other believers. We read our Bible. We pray. We're going to do all those things in heaven, guys. All the time. But the one thing we can't do is we can't go out and tell an unsaved person about Jesus Christ anymore. That day will be over. So we have an obligation and a duty and a privilege to tell others about Jesus Christ today while we can. Let it be our breath that we have to tell others. So what was Jesus' message? Matthew 4.17 says, From that time... Jesus began to preach, to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The exact same message. John the Baptist was on the same page as Jesus because he came after him and followed him. And Jesus was saying, change your thinking. Change your thinking whether it's we don't need a God or always lead to heaven or good is good enough. Any of those things that the devil tries to deceive us with. And guys, he's still out there deceiving today just as much as he ever was. That's his purpose. To steal us away from God's love so that we'll worship Him. We don't like to think we worship Him. But if anything is holding us back from serving our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then guess what? He has a hold on us, doesn't He? We're not believing and understanding what Scriptures tell us. We don't see, as we saw from Scripture this morning, that we need to be stewards of what God has given us. And He has given us so much as Christians in this country. But yet, we choose to be lazy with it, self-centered, content. So I'd say that's Satan having a hold on us instead of God. We may not want to look at it that way, but examine your own life. Who do you say that I am, Jesus asked. And Lord, what will you have me do? In the next couple verses... It says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. The very next words after Jesus said to repent and change your way of thinking was, are you going to do that? Are you going to change your way of thinking? Come follow after me. Leave this world behind. Start following after me. Don't let anything drag you down or have a hold on you. But come follow after me. And what? I will make you. I will send you out to be fishers of men. That's what we're called to do. Not to keep on living our life the same way. Not to study our Bibles more so that we can learn more. Not to pray more. But to be fishers of men. He could have put anything here. He could have said, and then we'll read Scriptures more and study and get prepared. But he said, I will send you out. I will make you fishers of men. That's why we're empowered with the Spirit. The Spirit gives us the things to say when we don't know what to say. It gives us the power. It gives us the direction. <clears throat> the word used here means to produce, the make or send, to produce, to construct, to fashion, to make ready, to prepare for the cause, to lead out and send. And Jesus says, I will do that. Because see, it's not about your might or your power or the things that you have or don't have, whether you're an eloquent speaker or not. Moses argued with God and said, I'm not these things. And then he appointed Aaron. Well, Aaron got the blessings that Moses could have had. God could have gave Moses everything that he needed and would have given him everything he needed, but Moses stubbornly refused to repent in that case. Now, I'm not cutting Moses. I'm just saying what we see and read from Scripture. 
So there are times where God wants to bless you with something and you don't see it and you don't go to this person and, and you say, maybe there's someone else that will go, that God has them in mind. If He's calling you, He doesn't have anyone else in mind to go to that person. But guess what? When you see someone else go to that person, it wasn't because He didn't have you in mind. It's because you refused to believe Him. So Aaron got the privileges. So your neighbor gets the privilege of leading someone to the Lord. Those treasures that you could build up in heaven instead of building up treasures here on earth. Jesus is clear in His teachings. He will make you fishers of men. So as soon as you come after Him, that's what Jesus' desire is for you, to make you a fisher of men. It's our primary job and responsibility. That's what... John the Baptist taught. That's what Jesus taught. And that's why Paul cries out so passionately in his letters that he longs to see those people, those fellow believers, so that he can come to them and teach them more so that they can get this infection that he has, this love for Jesus Christ, so that he can spread it to them. In Romans chapter 1, in the first three verses, it says, Paul, a servant, we've gone over this, that means a slave, Slave of who? Christ Jesus. Called an apostle. The words to be are not, are not in the original text. An apostle is one who is sanctified and set apart and made holy. It says, and set apart for the gospel of God. An apostle is one who is sent. We're all sent. We are set apart for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that God loves every sinner and wants them to repent and come to Him. The gospel that He promised beforehand... When you start reading this word, it tells of Jesus Christ from the beginning to the end of God's love. And that love is made complete through Jesus Christ. He is the only way, the truth, and the life. Before, through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding His Son. That's what it's all about. We could just have these three verses and realize what our calling is without going any further. Now, yes, we want to study God's Word, and yes, we want to pray and everything else. I'm not saying that. But these verses right here show us what we need to be concentrating on once we become saved. That's Paul's desire here. I'm not worried about anything else. I'm worried about these things because it is my mission. Yes, I live where I live, and I have the abilities in front of me that I have. I have my smartphone that has access to 40 different Bible translations and commentaries and everything. I have things that other people haven't dreamed of. The Bible used to not even be in the hands of common people. And we have it so readily available, do we share that much more exponentially to what we have available? Or do we get worried about the things of this world and do they distract us? Paul repented and changed his ways. He became a slave, a dulios, a servant, a bond slave. You don't just become a slave for Jesus. You have to do it willingly. You have to willingly lay down your life. Realize that your life is not your own. He's not going to make you go to that person that we talked about earlier. He might, but chances are He won't. Because He wants you to be obedient. You have free will. You have the right to choose to serve Him and make Him Lord of your life or not. But it is definitely God's will that you be sanctified, that you become holy, that you are fishers of men, that you tell others about Jesus Christ. Reading on down in verse 6, just so Paul makes it clear, he says, And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So many times we say, well, that's not my calling. That's Alan's calling. Or that's whoever's calling. Your calling is the same as mine. It's just in a different ministry, a different mission field. Your calling is to live a life that brings glory and honor to God and tell others of Jesus Christ. Period. We've got to realize that. We don't need to be envious of other people or anything else. We need to take what we have been given and be good stewards of it. All Christians who are born again are empowered by the same Spirit with the same purpose. It's why we have the Spirit of Union. It's why we come here. Not just to hear God's Word and take it home, but to hear God's Word and to strengthen each other and prepare each other so that we can go out and boldly tell others of Jesus Christ. We have an obligation to God. Paul writes that. 
that he is obligated. He knows that he was the chief of all sinners, but he doesn't look back at anymore at Saul. He only looks forward at Paul. He's been given that privilege, that responsibility. And if we read on in chapter 1, verse 14 through 18, it says, I am obligated both to the Greek and non-Greek, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Maybe you've seen the pattern here. If you've come to Romans, we went over to our Roman study, we went over it. So we're in chapter 2. Come if you can tonight. Okay, there's my plug. But if you didn't notice, you see, I am, I am, I am. Paul knows who he is now. He is no longer Saul. He is no longer himself. He doesn't live his life for himself. He is obligated to God Almighty to preach the gospel message. I am so eager to preach the gospel. It's what I live for now. Do I still get to go to McDonald's and have a cup of coffee and do everything? Yes, I do. Maybe that's where I'm going to witness today. I don't know. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he had every reason to be ashamed because look who he was. People are not going to know whether he's sincere or whether he wants to kill them. He was a Roman citizen. The Romans believed in everything that was against Jesus. They even had their um, unknown gods besides all their other gods. And he's not ashamed at all. Why? Because he knows that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation. Because that's what he has been called to do. That's what he's obligated and eager to do is preach the gospel message so that people can be saved. And in verse 17 we see two results. Either the person accepts the gospel message, becomes saved and takes on the righteousness of Jesus, a righteousness which is not their own, or the wrath of God will be revealed. A wrath that they're already under because of the wages that they deserve for their sin, their due penalty for the things that they've done. Because they've not accepted God who is clear in creation, neither thanked Him nor, nor worshipped Him. This is what we boil down to. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ to spread that gospel message. And like I say, in this country, I think we forget that so often because we think that God is blessing us because we're better than other people. We live a more righteous life. God, does, God sends the rain on the saved and the unsaved, the blessed and the unblessed, the righteous and the unrighteous, the poor and the rich because we need the rain to nourish this land. Jesus is clear in Scriptures that it's not because of what you've done that these things have happened. It's just because of the curse that we're under of sin. So we sit in the United States and think, well, I'm blessed when we see our country around us going down the tubes. We see people that proclaim Christians and say pray, but we have no idea who they're even talking about praying to and their lives simply do not reflect Jesus Christ. Don't forget the definition of Christian to be like Christ or a little Christ. So we have the responsibility to speak up even more because there's so much deception in this world today. So are you willing to become a dulios, a slave for Christ? It's definitely the right time and the right place. We can't say that it's not. <clears throat> are you willing to stand boldly so that others can hear the gospel message so that they can be saved, so that they can come after Jesus and He can make them fishers of men also. See, this is God's perfect plan. And if we do our part, look what could become. The power of God could be unleashed in this country and we could have a massive revival. Wouldn't that be great? But it starts right here with you and I being obedient fishers of men. That's why I told you last week for your homework, not last week, but the week before, to go home and read the last chapters of Acts so you could see the things that Paul went through and still boldly proclaimed. Now, I don't know if you did that or not, but I said that, and I'll give you some homework today, okay? 
I know you don't like homework, but I'm going to give you some. But in Acts 26, we'll go over just this chapter again briefly. Verses 15 through 18. Paul said, Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness, that's what we're called to do, of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue from, the, from your own people and from the Gentiles. What if Paul said just like we do, and I'm sure he did say it, these people are going to kill me. What, 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 what about this? I can't do this. God's clear here. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them. Why? To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to the power of God, right? So that they may receive forgiveness of sin, power that comes through the gospel, and a place among those who are sanctified by me in faith. This is what God told, or what Jesus told Paul to do, Saul at this time. Reading down in verse 28, it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think in such a short time that, that you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied this, Short time or long, it might take a day, it might take my whole life, but I know what I'm called to do. I pray to God that not only you, but all who listen, and they cannot listen if we don't speak the gospel message of Jesus Christ. All who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. I don't want them bound in prison. I want them to be able to freely proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I told you wrong last time. I told you that this king was the grandson of Herod the Great who killed all the babies. It was the great-grandson of Herod the Great. So see, I make my mistakes too. Because I forgot there was an Agrippa I and an Agrippa II. <laughs> that makes four generations. But it didn't matter to Paul. It didn't matter the history of the Herods. He proclaimed Jesus Christ. He didn't care about what might happen to him. In Romans, Paul writes this in chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one, one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching or proclaiming the gospel to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now again, you might want to just apply that to certain individuals. But that applies to all of us because we are sent, we are sanctified and set apart, we are holy, we are slaves for Jesus Christ. The problem is, do we realize it ourselves and are we willing to do that? All Christians are called to proclaim the gospel message. In the beginning of Matthew and Mark, we looked at that already and we see that Jesus' desire is for them to repent so that He can make them into fishers of men. You can read all through Matthew and Mark and you can see at the conclusion that Jesus still is telling the same thing. In Mark 16, 15, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Again, you might say, this is just to the twelve. No, it's to all of us. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, with a servant comes obedience. And Paul writes that further in his letter in Romans. Are you going to be obedient or not? And obedience means living a life that glorifies God, and then telling others why, what is different. So the last words of Jesus were the same of His first teachings. How many of you heard this saying? And you might tell me where it's found in the Bible. Bob, you don't. Preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. Is that in the Bible? Who said it? Go ahead, Bob. Okay. Do you know that if you investigate that, he probably didn't say that. And the way so many Christians use that today is, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. So by my life, by me doing these things, by me living a righteous life, they'll see Jesus in me. 
And if it's necessary, then I'll use words. See, the problem is, is it's always necessary. And how do you determine when it's necessary? Because if you live a good life and never tell one about Jesus Christ, then they're going to see that you lived a good life. They're not going to know it's because of Jesus. And they're going to die a good person if they pattern their life after you and still go to hell. Because good doesn't save us. Jesus Christ saves us. The power is in the gospel. If you do some research, you'll find that more than likely, because this is published in his works, that he said, it is no, it is no use walking anywhere to preach unless, you are, unless our walking is our preaching. That's quoted in his works. That doesn't say the same thing at all as what the other says. Now, yes, you can, if you understand the person saying, you look at his works and everything, you can say, well, I can see both of those things. But what he is saying here, it is no use going anywhere to preach and proclaim the gospel message if your life isn't living like Jesus in the first place. Big difference in what those words are. And so many people in the United States say, I'm living a good life. I go to church. They'll know I'm a Christian. They'll know you're a Christian and why you're a Christian because you tell them that Jesus Christ died for your sins because God loved you so much. That's how they'll know, by your words. We have to proclaim the gospel message. That's why Jesus said, I am going to send you out to be fishers of men. I will make you into that. 1 John 1, 1 through 3 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, our, looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim. They had to get out and tell others. Concerning the word of life, the life appeared, we have seen it and testify it to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was, the, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you, third time we've seen proclaim, what we have seen and heard. And they had to hear by someone proclaiming, didn't they? So that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. God longs for everyone to become into a right relationship with Him. That's why He created man in the first place. Not because He needs us or anything else, but He desired to have a relationship with us. And even when we sinned against God Almighty, He still loved us enough that He wanted us back. And the cost of that was His Son dying on the cross. That's how much God loves each and every one of us. That's how much we need to tell others so that they can hear and so that they can come into the fellowship. Acts 5 verse 42 says, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. It wasn't only in church. They went from house to house. And they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. This is the pattern that the disciples set for us so that we could follow them. As they imitated Christ, we could imitate them as well as Christ. The very next verse, you might not see it because you might stop there and start reading the next chapter and not realize, but it says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Why was it increasing? Because they were preaching the gospel message in the churches and going house to house, proclaiming what God had done for them and how much He loved them. And here's the formula. The disciples were increasing. The more that we tell people about Jesus Christ, the more that people will come to the salvation and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Period. Will we be rejected? Will we be mocked? May we be even in prison like Paul? Maybe. Especially the way the world's going. But we still have an obligation and a duty to tell others of Jesus Christ. Because it's so much more important than me putting on Facebook that I killed an elk to tell others of something that will save them for all eternity. <clears throat> the scripture from this morning was Luke chapter 12. If we look at Luke chapter 12 as a whole, verse 1 says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to His disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. 
See, crowds were following Jesus, but they were following after Jesus not because they wanted a Lord, not because they wanted to be a slave, but because they wanted, as John 6 says, their bellies filled. They wanted the healing that Jesus had to offer. They wanted things that would make their life better. But if you look at Jesus' teachings, that's not what He teaches. He teaches for you to be a slave sold out to Him, and then you will reap treasures that you could never imagine. If I drew lines all over this wall, all over these walls, this far apart, and put a dot in one place, that would not fairly represent our lives on this earth compared to eternity. And we work for that one little dot. You would, you would never even be able to find it if I did that. And yet we spend so much effort working for that dot rather than re working for treasures forever. And it says that the angels rejoice whenever a lost person comes back. That they rejoice in heaven. Why are we not making it such a passion here on earth? Verse 4 says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you of whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you to fear him. Why do we worry about what our neighbors might say? If we're not, not serving God and telling others because of our joy, we should at least be doing it out of fear and reverence. Keep reading, verse 12 says, For the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time what you should say. You don't have to rely on your own might. God will give you everything you need. You just have to be willing. Willing to lay down your life and come after Jesus. And then He will make you a fisher of men. Why would the Holy Spirit say that He'll tell us the things to say unless we're supposed to say them? Unless we're supposed to proclaim the gospel message? Verse 21 through 23. This is how it will be with whosoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to His disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. More than that one dot. Continuing to read on in verse 32 through 34. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Get rid of everything if it, if it holds you back. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. Treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes in, comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Scripture is clear about how God searches for those who have a heart that is focused on Him. If your heart's not focused, your mind's not going to be. And we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, body, mind, and soul. Verse 38 says, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night and towards daybreak. Now all that's leading up to this parable which we read this morning. Verse 41 says, Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Because see, it is for everyone. And you might, you, uh, your homework is to go home and read what we read this morning. Okay, got your homework? Luke 12, 42 through 48. Jesus doesn't just come out and say, this is for everyone or this is for you. But if you read what He's saying, He talks about being a good and faithful steward. That applies to all of us again. And Peter even asked, because he's like, does this apply to everybody? Because this is hard teaching. Is everyone supposed to lay down their life as a slave for the gospel? Yes. And then you'll build up treasures in heaven. And guess what? You'll still have treasures on earth. More than likely, He will not require you to give up everything and be in chains like Paul. He might. And if He is, we need to learn to be content. But we have to be willing to serve because salvation is what's on the line. And then that passage closes out at the end of verse 48. It says, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And that's how I started out this morning. I have no idea. Rationally, I cannot figure it out. Why me, Lord? Why did you bless me so much? At the time when I went to Christian school, I wanted to go to public high school. 
because that's where the cool kids were. I didn't understand why I had to go there. Now I praise God that, that He gave me that opportunity, that He trained me up, that I remember the Awana verses that, that we learned and they're still embedded strong in my heart because I went to Awanas and my mom served in Awanas and everything. Why? Why was I so blessed? I have no idea. But what I do know is that I am responsible as a result to be a good steward of what He has given me. To tell others how much He loved me and that He loves them just the same. No matter where they're at in their lives, no matter what things are holding them down, whether they see hope or don't see hope, that Jesus Christ can take all that upon His shoulders and offer forgiveness once and for all and bring salvation and adoption to God the Father because He loves them so much. So that's my prayer today, is that you realize the passion that Paul had. The passion that I am seeing more and more in my life. That when I do surrender more and more to Jesus, I just get more and more treasures. And I do see them even in this earth. Not just forever, everything else but that dot. But even if I don't see them in this dot, the other is worth so much more. And it's worth so much more to know that my God loved me that much. Let's pray. Father, help us to be a lamp and a light to this world. Help us to be willing to lay down our lives, to make a difference. Not to rely on our own mights, but to rely on You, God, because Your words are faithful and true. You will make us to be what we need to be in Your sight, to be fishers of men. Lord, I do thank You so much for this church that You have blessed me to be a part of, to be able to be a shepherd, to be able to be a friend, to be a brother and sister to all that are here. You have blessed me so much. And Lord, I just thank You for each and every one. I thank You for their service. I just pray today for a renewed heart that we will come together. We will be individuals, but we'll come together also and make a difference in our community in this world. To stand firm, even if the world falls around, around us. And that we'll tell others about Jesus Christ as we eagerly await Your return. And that we will see our reward forever in heaven by Your side. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.